I'm going to talk to you today about tuning your toolbox for velocity and value. I'm talking about application security scanning tools here. And I find it best to, to start off with a story. So I'll give you some background as to where I, where I came into this, where I started thinking about this. So a couple of years ago, I came in as a consultant to work in a pretty large development organization. They're like, yeah, we would like you to come in and, and help out our, our AppSec team. We'd like you to, uh, you know, we, we had an AppSec person and we'd like someone else. And I, so I was like, yes, that, that's very much what I do. That's uh, exciting for me, helping uh, developers build software securely. So, uh, so I go into the organization and it turns out that um, I'm pretty much the only AppSec person in a massive sea of developers. <laughs> So I was like, okay, this is uh, already an interesting challenge, but uh, again, it's definitely very much part of what I'm interested in doing, what I like doing. So I thought, okay, well, let's get stuck in. Let's figure out what's going on. Let's understand what the AppSec program currently looks like. Let's currently un understand what they're doing for application security. And I started digging in, sort of reading through their documentation and understanding their processes. And it became clear quite fast that their AppSec program was actually an AppSec tools program. Because their entire program basically consisted of we've got this tool, we've got that tool, we've got this other tool, we've got SAS, we've got DAST, we've got SCA. And the AppSec program was going through the results of these tools. Which might be good, except they were absolutely buried in findings. They had lists after lists after lists of issues, findings, potential false positives, actual false positives, false positives that they thought they'd suppressed but had actually come back the next time around. They were, they were absolutely drowning in this. So their AppSec program, which was actually an AppSec tools program, was actually a very long list of possible security findings program. And remember, there weren't any security people looking at this. This was all going on to the developers. And they were like, oh, yeah, we've got a security champions program, though, where we um, have one of our developers in each team as a security champion. But that person's job then became, oh, you're the person who now gets all these findings. <laughs> these are now your responsibility. Congratulations. Um, unsurprisingly, they had quite a uh, significant turnover because of this. So what happened was when I started trying to talk about security, when I started trying to talk about application security with developers, they would just disappear. <laughs> they were not interested. You know, this is, security had become a frustration. Security had become like, oh, no, the terrible findings. Like, don't come and talk to me about this. You know, security is a problem. Security becomes a headache. And so they had a few key issues. So the first key issue, they hadn't stabilized one tool. They had all these tools. They brought them all in at once, but they hadn't stopped and thought, OK, how do we make this tool work well? How do we build this into our processes? How do we work effectively with this tool? How can we you know, get to some sort of business as usual state where we've got an ongoing, sensible workload? They didn't have good accuracy. They were constantly dealing with, dealing with false positives. You know, developers are sitting going, this is nonsense, this is nonsense, this is rubbish, this doesn't make any sense. I can't even understand what this is trying to say, but it's clearly not a security issue. They didn't have good numbers. When they finally got numbers, they started pulling raw numbers out of a tool that didn't represent their actual position because they were struggling so much with the tool that they didn't have accurate numbers even within the tool. That way they couldn't report progress, they couldn't get an accurate picture of where they were up to. And they couldn't report this on to management to say, OK, here's how we're doing. And finally, they didn't have a good triage process. They didn't have a defined way of saying, here's how we're going to go through these findings. Here's how we're going to approach this. So what I'd like to do over the next 30 to 40 minutes is to talk through some ideas about how to improve this, how to make this better. And to do this, I'm going to focus on, on three key areas. I like my talk to be quite structured, um, so hopefully it's easier to, easy to follow sort of where we're up to and what we're talking about at each stage. So the first area I want to focus on is proficiency. Understanding what is this tool doing, how is it solving our problems, what do we want it to do for us? I'm going to talk about utility. How can we configure the tool in the way that we need? How can we get the specific configuration for the tool that's going to answer our, our particular needs, how it's going to fit into our particular process. And finally, I want to talk about methodology. 
things we can think about when we're addressing findings to actually take a structured approach, to take a repeatable approach and you know, concepts that are going to make it easier for us to think about, OK, here's a finding, here's how I'm going to address it, or here's, the, here's how I'm going to remediate it. So all these split into a few ideas. Like I said, I'm going to run through each idea. Oh, we'll get to the ideas in a second, though. But yeah, these are the three key areas of the talk. So before I get into that, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about myself, just introduce myself. My name is Josh Grossman. Uh, I work as an application security consultant and CTO for a company called Bounce Security. And you know, our day-to-day -day is very much about working with organizations, working with developers, helping them build securely. You know, my, uh, Check had passed, I've done uh, penetration testing and that sort of thing, but I, I got to the point where I wanted to stop breaking things and start trying to build instead, um, or help others build more securely. And that's very much our day-to-day. -day. And that means that I work with a lot of development organizations, see lots of different environments. I also give talks, I give training, just finished up a two days workshop here at NDC. And it gives me hopefully a reasonably wide perspective of the sort of challenges people see in organizations see in application security. In my spare time, I'm quite involved with OWASP. I'm uh, on the chapter board for the OWASP Israel chapter, where I'm based. I'm also one of the co-leaders of the OWASP ASVS project. If you want to hear more about OWASP, I'll be giving a 10-minute lightning talk uh, this afternoon, I think in this room, at uh, I think it's just after lunch. So maybe I'll talk a little bit more about OWASP then. Uh, I'm in my actual free time. I put up some pictures of uh, my actual hobbies as well. A few disclaimers. Um, not everything here will work for everyone. Some things may be slightly situation dependent. But I think hopefully everyone here will sit and think, OK, this is a useful idea. This, you know, at least some of these ideas you can take back to organizations and try and apply and try and you know, use them to make the processes better. And yeah, I'm, whenever I'm giving talks like this, I always go vendor agnostic. I try not to talk about specific vendors. I don't think I'm talking about any specific vendors at all this time around. Um, I always get a stick for that, but um, yeah, the idea is to make it applicable to the types of tool and not to a particular vendor. So like I said, the plan is to go quickly through what I mean when I talk about testing tools. I already threw out some buzzwords, but in case anyone's not familiar with them, I want to just clarify what I'm talking about there. And then we'll go into the three areas, three sets of ideas, and then I'll, I'll quickly summarize up at the end. So when I think about testing tools, I think about two axes, let's say. On the one hand, we're we looking at our code, we're we looking at third-party code, someone else's code. That's one axis. On the other axis is we're doing this at uh, design time, at static time, you know, while the, the code's on disk, or we're we doing it at runtime while the application is actually running. So first of all, SAST, static application security testing. Something that's happening on our code, but it's at design time, at coding time. It's scanning the code on disk. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about SAST. SCA, software composition analysis, it's also you know, scanning what's running on disk. But this time around, it's looking at third party code. It's looking at the libraries that we're using, it's looking at the dependencies that we're using. And finally, DAST, or dynamic application security testing, as you might guess, runs at runtime, while the code is, run, is running dynamically. So that is scanning the running application. So those are the three types of tool I'm going to refer to. Some of the tips are specific to one of the tools. Some of the tips are specific to a couple of tools. Some of the tips are relevant to all the tools. But overall, this is, these are the tools I'm going to be focusing on today. So like I say, three areas of uh, advice, a few different ideas inside each area. We're going to dive into each one of these in turn. So let's start off with proficiency. The idea of, okay, what does the tool bring us? What the, does the tool do for us? What do we need to do in order to actually make the tool solve our problems? So the first one, which I think is one of those things that can be a little bit overlooked, is about software composition analysis. Okay, Software composition analysis is, broadly speaking, looking for libraries that we're using and then trying to figure out, do any of them have known vulnerabilities? 
Now, if we're using a modern application, a modern application stack, package manager, it may be quite easy to pull out that information. It may be that's all listed in one file, one package manager file, maybe that's package.json or some other configuration file that says, here are all the packages, here are all the dependencies that this application is using. But if we're using an older application, if we've got an older application stack, or maybe it's sort of grown organically over several years and maybe several teams, and no one really knows what's in it anymore, then we might have to, you know, the tool might need to actually go start scanning through properly and figuring out, okay, can I find these files, can I find those files related to known dependencies? Now, the problems come along, you know, okay, so if we've got no package manifest, so what can the tool go rely on? Can the tool rely on maybe the library files themselves and the way that they're structured inside the application, the way that they're stored inside the application location? But what if they've been moved around? What if they're no longer in the same location when, as when they started, or how they're structured in the original, let's say, install of the, of the dependency. What happens if the file names have changed? Maybe there's some internal naming convention. Maybe they changed it to include a version. Maybe they changed it to exclude a version. And now the file name is no longer the same file name that, that dependency had when it was first published. Maybe the file content has changed. Maybe we're adding comments to the top of these dependencies, or had to add in something custom at the beginning of the file. Had to recompile it in some way. And now the checksum is going to be different. So even if the tool knows how to scan through files and look for files with a particular checksum, that might not be valid anymore. That might not work anymore. And what if we've ended up bundling a bunch of libraries together? Maybe we've got some sort of um, <laughs> homegrown minification process where we're taking a bunch of different text libraries and we're putting them all into one file for either efficiency or convenience or some old reason that no one remembers anymore because the person who did that no longer works here. But if we've got you know, this somewhat untidy application location, but we're still trying to keep track of what's going on in our dependencies, we need to understand, is the tool going to be able to find libraries in this case? Now, I worked with a client where they had a very sort of messy application location. They've been sort of pulling JavaScript libraries down left, right, and center. And I, I had a discussion with the, the vendor about it. And eventually, they were like, yeah, you're going to have to like, find those yourselves. I thought, well, that, that's what I'm paying you to do. <laughs> you know, I'm paying you, you to bring me a tool that will find these libraries. I could do it myself anyway. So it's important to understand, you know, what are the capabilities? If the tool that you're using looks really shiny and looks really nice, but requires a package manifest and you've not got that everywhere, then you might need an alternative tool. So the next thing to think about is, what is it going to take to get a scan? What is it going to take to get a set of results? So we talk, hear a lot about you know, the concept of uh, shifting left, or I like to think about it as spreading left. Um, try and move security earlier in the, in the process. And tools are a good way of doing that, depending on how early you can run the tool. You know, there are some tools that you might be able to run already in the IDE. You can run something in the IDE while the developer is writing their code, while they're you know, building their initial version of their feature, of their module, and they'll get immediate feedback. You know, whilst they're coding, they'll get that immediate feedback. You know, if the tool can run on this, un, you know, maybe even uncompilable code, then that's quite early on. But it may be that in order for the tool to work properly, it needs compiled code. It needs to be able to actually compile the code in order to do, do that. It may be that it needs to run on compiled binaries. It doesn't want the code. It wants the uh, compiled, you know, installable file. Now that, you might think, oh, well, that's OK, because I, I was going to do that anyway. You know, I, was, <laughs> I was already going to go through that process to deploy my application. But it may want those binaries in a particular format. It may want them with specific configuration, like debug flags and stuff, that you wouldn't necessarily have in your production application. So in that case, you may have to have set up some separate process. And again, it's going to be later on. It's going to be after the developer's already written the code and finished writing, and they've compiled, and it's gone through CI to actually get it into that compiled form. And obviously, you know, certainly for the case of something like Dast, you may need to have runnable code, you know, an application that actually runs in order to test. And that already takes it a little bit further away from the point in time when the original code was, was written. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. This isn't necessarily a disadvantage, but it's important to understand at which stage does the tool, tool come in. How fast are you getting results? How, how sort of small is that feedback loop? Is that feedback coming immediately about findings? Is that feedback coming after a few days? Is that a few weeks? And just consider that as part of your plan for how you're integrating the tool. So this is very SCA specific, this next point, next point. But it can be something I think gets a little bit forgotten about. Now, I remember, it must have been almost, no, just over two years ago, 
Uh, it was a Friday uh, in Israel, Friday's the weekend, and I was idly browsing Twitter because, uh, as you can see, I, my hobbies also seem to involve security. Um, and someone mentioned some sort of issue in a library called Log4J. I'm sort of looking at Twitter, I'm like, hmm, this looks like it might be, uh, <laughs> might be something. And I was working with a client at the time who did have people working on a Friday. Um, so I sort of pinged them, emailed them something like, you might want to take a look at this, like, maybe take a look at what we're doing about this because you know, this looks like it might turn into a thing. Um, which clearly it did turn into a thing. Um, but that's, how it, that's a somewhat comical way that I found out about that particular vulnerability. Now, Log4j was an example where we couldn't wait for a scan to happen and a report to get generated and someone to go through triage. And that was a case of, you know, pretty much roll instant response, start finding where we're using that and deal with it right away. So it's important to have the sort of business as usual, regular process where, okay, you're going to run scans, you're going to get reports, you're going to triage it, but don't forget about the urgent issues as well. Don't forget about things where you have to drop everything and actually investigate immediately. And you know, how are you going to find out about that? You're not going to wait until it comes up on some sort of scan report. You know, is your vendor going to provide you that information? Do you have separate threat intelligence that will provide you that sort of information? I mean, Twitter two years ago was a little bit different to Twitter now. Um, a little bit less reliable nowadays, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, how are you going to find that information? How are you going to keep that feed of sort of urgent news coming? It's something you need to sort of consider at the back of your mind. It's, it's sort of a separate process, but at the same time, it's the same problem. It's, OK, I've got a problem in my code. I've got a problem in my libraries. How am I going to discover that? How am I going to find out about that? Now, what SCA particularly can help with in that case is the inventory aspect. Usually, what SCA has to do is figure out, OK, here are all the libraries that you've got running in your application, and then go and say, well, these are the known vulnerabilities in those libraries. But that inventory of, OK, here are all the libraries that you've got running in this application, that in itself can be quite important. Because I can say, OK, well, where am I using this library? Where am I using this particular version of this library? Here are all the packages where I'm using, sorry, here are all the applications where I'm using this library. And then you know, OK, here's where I need to investigate. Here's where I need to actually figure out, am I using this? Do I need to upgrade it? Can I upgrade it? Et cetera, et cetera. So the tool gives you that inventory. The tool saves you that sort of panic of, OK, how am I going to find this? What sort of grep or file searches am I going to do to, in order to discover this? Uh, and yeah, that's you know, the inventory or the, the SBOM concept. I assume you've, you know, SBOM software bill of materials is sort of a posh word for an inventory. You know, what's in this software? So that's something that SCA can particularly help with as well. There we go. All right, so. The user interface. Everyone, like, everyone likes good user interface. Um, that's my uh, home setup. I think I fall under chaotic evil there, um, but not necessarily as chaotically evil as uh, this one. So, <laughs> so I think there's a bit of emphasis nowadays on, and this is correct to a certain extent. You know, the idea that okay, we want tools to be built into our processes. We want them going into you know, interfaces that the developers are familiar with. We don't want them to have to start looking somewhere else. You know, we want them to go into their ticketing systems and you know, in their IDEs and wherever they're used to looking. We don't want them to have to sort of pull out to this external interface. But that doesn't mean we can ignore the interface. It doesn't mean we can say, well, this tool has great integrations, so let's just ignore that interface altogether because. Certainly at the beginning, whilst you're first setting up the tool, first configuring the tool, and occasionally also if you're going to get new types of results or results where there's question marks around, okay, what does that actually mean? What's the actual interpretation here? Something like SAS, you may want to see the code flow that's going to be difficult to represent in a ticketing system, that, you know, some sort of um, slight, somewhat removed version of the result. So you're going to need to make sure that the tool itself does have an interface you can use. Uh, I certainly say with some of the... Well, some of the uh, Free tools, I think maybe the interface side is a challenging part, and then they tend to be less invested in that area. You know, it's making sure you can see the views that you need, making sure that you can get the metrics and the numbers out, and potentially reports that you need to pull out. We'll talk more about metrics later on. Um, like I say, code flows for SAS. If you've got a sophisticated SAS tool that knows how to follow code and follow inputs through the application, you want to make sure that you can see clearly, OK, well, how did that actually happen? You know, where, what did that code flow look like? Where did that? Start, where do they end, where do they go in the meantime? Ultimately, you know, you're going to spend some time in there. The ideal is that one day you'll get to a smooth enough process that you know, things that are really important go into the ticketing system, but you can't ignore the user interface. You can't ignore the fact that there's you know, certain things you're going to have to go into the tool 
and understand in more detail. So I actually started off talking about this for DAST, but I've got a slide about SAST as well, because uh, it sort of applies the same thing. So DAST is scanning the running application. But DAST can only find vulnerabilities in functionality that it can find. It can only find vulnerabilities in parts of the application that it can actually browse to, it can figure out how to browse to. Now, most DAST tools will have some sort of crawling mechanism that sort of looks for links, looks for buttons, looks for forms, and tries to browse through the application to discover functionality. But if your application works a little bit differently, if it's got a, you know, I've seen applications with some very weird navigation mechanisms um, that you know, didn't follow the standard sort of forms or um, JavaScript events. So if your application is using that sort of unusual navigation, or even, you know, even if your DAS tool is a little bit old and doesn't understand you know, modern JavaScript-heavy applications, and the, the tool isn't going to find the functionality, so it's not going to find vulnerabilities in that functionality. So how can you steer the tool? How can you tell the tool what to look for? So there are various different options here. You might be able to give it a list of links. Here are a list of URLs that are valid in my application. You might be able to give it, there might be a browser add-in that comes with the tool that lets you browse through the application yourself, and then from seeing what you did in the application, the tool then understands, okay, here's how I browse through the application. Uh, if you're using APIs, you might be able to give it a Swagger file, or an open API, API file, or a Postman file that has a definition. And, you know, th those are particularly good because it can see the full request, it can see the URL, it can see the parameters, it might be able to see any headers, so it, it gets a good understanding of what it actually needs to, to test. Um, you can also, I think it's supported in Chrome, probably other browsers as well, you can basically take a full request log. It's something basically you browse through the application, it records your traffic, and then you put that into the DAS tool and it now understands what it needs to do to browse through the application. You know, your tool may support one of these, it may support multiple options of these, but you need to figure out you know, how am I going to steer the tool, how am I going to drive it towards the functionality that I want it to test. Because one of the biggest problems with DAS is coverage. How do you actually cover enough of the application? How do you cover the functionality you need to cover? And, you know, don't get me started on teaching the, application, uh, the tool how to log in, that's a whole other thing. But even if you've got it to log in, you know, how are you going to actually get coverage within the application? Oh, and by the way, this isn't a one-time thing. You know, this isn't like, okay, we've done this once, we've loaded up the tool, and now we're done, because in most cases, you're adding new functionality to the application every time, every sprint, every increment. Oh, there's a new module, oh, there's a new feature, there's a new function. So how are you going to do this on a periodic basis? How are you going to keep that DAS tool loaded with the, the uh, targets that it needs to actually scan? But the same also goes for SAST. So to understand this, we need to go dive a little bit into SAST theory. Um, but in general, a lot of findings in SAS and a lot of findings in general for security at the code level will come from, okay, we've got a source. We've got where input is coming into the application. Okay, we've got something coming into the application. We've got a sanitizer. We're, we've got that input, and we're making that safe for a particular context. Okay, we're sanitizing that input to make it safe to use in a particular dangerous context or potentially dangerous context. And then we've got the sync. This is where we're actually now using the input, but hopefully we've filtered out or sanitized out or made that safe for use in that context, in that sync. In this case, a lovely cup of tea. So if, it's, if we have sort of generic sanitizers, you know, things that are well known in that framework, okay, this is how you make this safe for writing to a web page in Python. This is how you make a query safe for doing SQL queries in PHP. And if it's well known, then the SAS tool might know about it. If you've had to write your own custom version of that, you have to write something to do that for you, because either you're in a particular situation where you can't use a generic option, or maybe no generic option exists, then you might have to write a custom sanitizer, at which point the question is, can you teach the tool about your custom sanitizer so it's not giving you a whole load of false positives? Because you can end up with a situation where you're doing something that's potentially dangerous, you have sanitized the input so that it's clean, so it's not going to cause some sort of dangerous impact. But because the tool doesn't recognize the sanitizer, it's like, oh, you're doing something dangerous. And now you've got you know, 20, 30 findings about doing something dangerous. So can you steer the tool in terms of teaching it, you know, these are false positives, I don't want to see these because I know this input is being sanitized by my function. So it's another way, maybe a little bit less critical than for DAS, but it's also another way of teaching the tool to be more accurate and to give you more focused results. So those are the proficiency points. 
Move on to utility. So metrics. So I hinted about this before, when this uh, organization I was working with and the story at the beginning. So they had these tools, and one of the problems with the tools was that the tools were wrong. The tools were wrong in a variety of different ways, and they could not be fully updated to make the information correct. So what they did was they did what any normal organization does, and they made an Excel spreadsheet. And they pulled the data out into the spreadsheet, and they made adjustments in the spreadsheet, and that was sort of their source of truth, um, which was a painful and ongoing, difficult experience. And they were just, sort of about, just about coping, until one day they were informed that now management was pulling data di directly from the tool into the organizational BI system, and that all the VPs are going to be seeing these numbers at uh, the, the monthly meeting. And now they had to try and explain, okay, well, actually, these numbers aren't correct because of, you know, we had to make adjustments, whatever else, and then they then have to prepare each month an explanation for the VPs as to why the numbers they were seeing weren't the numbers they were supposed to be seeing. It was a whole mess. And I guess the, le the lesson there is that if you're, not, if you're not pulling out sort of good metrics, accurate metrics, the metrics that you want to be showing, then someone else is going to do that for you. Someone else is going to figure out how to measure that. Someone else is going to measure, figure out how to try and keep track of performance, and you may not like the result. So I see this in a few different ways. Uh, the first is how we measure how we're doing with the tool. How well is the tool doing? How well is the tool, tool performing for what we need it to do? So that might be the quality of data coming from the vendor. It might be you know, how often is extra data that comes from the vendor making our lives easier? How often is that making our triage faster because we've got this extra context? How long is it taking to perform scans? Or can we do quick scans and long scans? You know, is it fitting into our overall processes or is it causing a delay? Are we having to wait days and days for a scan to complete? Uh, coverage we talked about with DAST, is it covering all of our application with the, you know, the static tools? Does it cover all the languages and the frameworks that we use? And obviously accuracy, you know, how much of our time are we spending on false positives compared to time spent on real actual results. Uh, from our perspective, how well are we doing? I'd always try and, wherever possible, compare ourselves to a target. This is what we intended to do, and this is how we're doing. Rather than just, you know, don't just spit out a raw number saying this is our current position, because that doesn't give much context, that doesn't give much insight into what we plan to do. But if we can compare ourselves to plan, then at least we have some sort of measure of, you know, are things going as we expected? Also, we try and avoid sort of just having one big number saying, this is a number, you know, number big, bad, number small, good. Try and capture, you know, what have we achieved in this last period, in this last increment? What have we fixed? Okay, maybe there are new vulnerabilities as well. But let's not lose those wins. Let's not lose the fact that we've actually made progress, we've made efforts, and we've reduced a certain number of vulnerabilities. We can also use the information coming out of this to drive training. Okay, we're seeing a whole load of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. We should probably up our developer training about cross-site scripting. Or if we're already doing training, maybe we need to focus it better. Maybe we're not training for the specific situations that developers are seeing in their day-to-day. -day. If we're seeing the same issues coming back again and again and again, then maybe we need to focus that training. We need to make sure, is it talking about the right framework? Is it talking about the right language? Is it talking about the right situation for cross-site scripting? or for any vulnerability if we're seeing it come up again and again. So we're taking the information we've got and we're using it to try and improve at an earlier stage. So I talked about these being AppSec scanning tools, you know, application security scanning tools. That doesn't mean that only application security people are involved in using them. You know, this, getting one of these tools into the organization, operating one of these tools in the organization is you know, there's, there's jobs for everyone here. There's roles for lots of different people. You know, first of all, to actually oversee that process, be it the upfront integration, be it the ongoing working through the results, you may want someone who's more on the project side, on the project management side, to actually figure out, okay, what are the stages of doing this? Are we on top of this? Are tasks getting done? Are vulnerabilities getting remediated? You know, that's not necessarily a security question, that's a project management and progress question. You know, development teams already have project managers for the most part to make sure is development progressing. This is just an extension of that. In terms of running, maintaining the scan, you know, the actual technical realities of running a scan probably going to go into your CI pipeline, in which case, you know, who maintains your CI pipelines? Who maintains your automation? That's probably not the AppSec people. That's probably DevOps or you know, some other branch of the automation team. Now, looking through the results, that's 
probably the most AppSec um, role this whole process. You actually understand the results and reviewing the results, although maybe the AppSec want to be able to delegate that as well. They want to be able to start off by saying, look, we're going to do the initial review or we're going to review the first few, but we're also going to train security champions or other developers to understand these results as well so that we can spread our impact so that we're not relying on AppSec for absolutely all the results. And you know, certainly in terms of fixing, that's going to require developer time. That's going to require architect time. That's going to require someone who's very familiar with the code to actually go in and make fixes. Now, you know, maybe your AppSec people can make fixes here and there, um, but there are far more people involved in this than just the security people. This is not a security process. This is security providing guidance for a development process. And that's how it needs to be seen, which then nicely brings us into the idea that we're not going to get this to happen by ourselves. We're not going to have security going to developers and asking favors and say, look, could you just like, fit this into your spare time? Could you just like, have a look at these findings when you get a couple of minutes downtime? Now, this has to be a planned activity. This has to be pushed top down. You know, there's an old trope that uh, security is everyone's job. Security is not everyone's job. I mean, there is nothing that's everyone's job. Someone's job is what their team leader or what their manager says that their job is. It's what they're assessed on. It's what they're chased over. It's what you know, they're being expected to do. It's what they're being asked for by their senior leadership, by the management. If security is just something that comes from the side, from the security people going, oh, could you help me out with this? But in the meantime, the product team or the development, team, you know, the development managers are saying, you, know, you need that feature you know, committed to main by tomorrow so that we can deliver it to a customer next week. It's not going to happen. And you shouldn't expect it to happen. And you know, if you try as a security person to, to do that, then you're going to end up with a hard relationship with the development team. So we need management buy-in to actually make this happen. We need management to say, this is now part of the job. This is now part of the development process. You know, if we have 10-day sprints and we want to get security stuff done, then maybe one of those days in the sprint has to be doing security stuff, has to be dedicated to handling these activities that have come as a result of the tools and scans. But that's not the security people asking that. That's development leadership saying this is now part of the job. This is now part of the process. You're, you know, this is what you're expected. This is what you're being assessed on. Now, there are things we're going to need around that. We make sure, make sure we've got, you know, we can use these metrics and we define our plan and we know what the plan is and we get management to agree with that. And then we have a process for saying, okay, this hasn't gone to plan or we're going to overrun our uh, agreed time for fixing this. You have to have some sort of exceptions process. And that exception process can't become the norm. It can't be the case that, you know, this, you know, the exception process is the only process that actually happens. Oh, we breached this one. Oh, yeah, like we did last week, and like we did the week before, and like we did the week before. You know, if that happens, there's some mismatch in expectations, and again, there has to be a discussion at a high level saying, okay, how, what do we want to actually achieve? What do we want to happen here? And how are we going to make sure that developers are given the agency to actually do that? So I talked about where you can get a scan. And I mentioned IDE level scanners, which I think is a good, good way of getting immediate feedback, especially if a full scan takes a little bit longer. Um, but I think there are some expectations that have to be set here as well. You know, this, is, this is now a process that's sat in developers' IDE and therefore is very much in their face. And if it doesn't work well, then again, they've got security in their face, um, giving them a bad time. So a few like gotchas that I've seen with these sort of tools. You know, the first thing, obviously, is to make sure it doesn't take a long time, doesn't slow things down. You know, I've had developers complain that this will slow down their IDE. If it's going to do that, then it may not be worth the hassle. If it's given them lots of false positives, it's given them lots of incorrect results, then again, they're seeing that right immediately in their IDE. You know, this is not right, right this is not right. And you know, they're immediately going to be put off by that. Uh, the other side of that is to make sure they understand that it might not catch everything. You know, it may be that the, the IDE level scan is going to be looking at that particular part of code but it's not looking at the code as a whole. It may be that when the tool looks as a code, at the code as a whole, when it does the full scan, it might find other things as well. But at least there should be hopefully some low-hanging fruit, some basic issues that it's going to be covering whilst the code is still being written, whilst the code is still in the IDE. So those are the points on uh, utility. So moving on to methodology about triage. So one of the biggest things for avoiding having to go through loads of results is maybe don't create loads of results to begin with. You know, these tools, depending on how, sort of, how, how established, how you know, long running these tools are, they've acquired a whole load of different rules, a whole load of different checks that you can do. 
if you switch all of them on and do all of them every single time, you're going to get a lot of results. You're going to get a lot of findings. You probably can't go through all those findings at once. So maybe start off by saying, what are the most interesting things here? What are the things that I want to focus on? What are the things that I'm most worried about right now? Start off with those rules, handle the findings from those rules, and then move on to another set. It means instead of having this overwhelming list of, oh, there are loads and loads and loads of findings, Instead, we've got a position where we're saying that we can try and solve a few specific problems up front and then gradually strengthen our policy, gradually make our pol policy stricter. Now, obviously, that needs some expectations management. You, know, you run the scan for the first time with a limited rule set. That's not everything. You know, this isn't everything in the application. This is everything we want to deal with right now, though. Again, it sort of, it sort of speaks to that idea of you know, testing according to plan, thinking about it according to plan. You know, what do we want to achieve in the upcoming increment, in the upcoming few increments. These are the ones we want to address. We've set ourselves a realistic target of the things that are most concerning to us right now, and we're now going to try and address those findings. Now, how you choose that, I guess the, you know, the primary thing, you know, what's going to give you the best signal? What's going to give you the most valid results compared to noise? You may have to do some experimentation. You know, this is a, it is a security thing where you need to maybe do some experimentation, see what sort of results coming out, decide what that policy is going to look like before you actually push them over to developers to be fixed. Um, what's going to cause the highest risk for the application? Now, that may be, OK, these are the criticals from the tool. Or it may be, well, we know that in this application, um, the database is particularly sensitive. So anything that might risk stealing data from the database, we're going to put first, because that's our, that's our biggest business risk for this application. So yeah, maybe the, the raw severity from the tool. It may be what's most risky from the application's perspective. The other thing I'd say at this stage is try and have a blend of things that are easy to fix and things that are hard to fix. I hope you've got some sort of view, OK, well, with this particular problem, I, know I have a rough idea what's going to be required to fix it. I have a rough idea what the remediation is. Now, sometimes it might be a one-liner, and sometimes it might be a, a very large, somewhat more complicated fix across the code base to address it. And if you keep pushing that off because, OK, let's fix the low-hanging fruit and then focus on the hard stuff later, then the hard stuff won't happen because there'll be more low-hanging fruit and more sort of straightforward things. And Eventually, you get to a stage where you know, the hard stuff just ne never happens. It never gets done. But if you can do them both together, you're maintaining velocity. You're getting some things fixed. But you're also making progress on the harder fixes, on the more complicated fixes, on the things that require more development time or more regression testing. So I started off talking, thinking about this for, with uh, SAS, but it kind of applies to all the tools. The idea of, you know, is something actually unexploitable? So I've seen a few examples where there's a big question, OK, is this vulnerability exploitable? Is this vulnerability not exploitable? And sometimes the answer is it's not exploitable, but not because we've presented the vulnerability. It might be because we've done something else. Maybe there's some sort of validation process, some sort of business process that says, OK, well, this piece of data is a number. This piece of data is only ever a number, so it gets to the vulnerable function. It's only a number, so it can't exploit that function. But we didn't do that because we're trying to prevent, let's say, SQL injection. We did that because we want this to be a number, because someone made a business decision and that's the case. Someone makes a business decision tomorrow that that's now a string. We have now got a vulnerable, um, an exploitable vulnerability. Now, if our tool is very clever and can detect that that flow has changed and that that validation is no longer there, then great. But there's no guarantee that it can detect that. So we've now got something that, right now, it is accidentally unexploitable. If we tell the tool, I don't want to see that again because I don't think that's exploitable, then when it does become exploitable, we may not know, discover that. We may not find out about that. Similarly, data may get messed around a different way. Maybe data comes in and gets hashed, or it gets some sort of prefix added, or it gets some other um, change made to it. But again, it's not for a security reason. It's for some sort of business reason. It's some sort of functionality reason. And that is stopping us from being exploitable right now. But again, in the future, that business decision changes, that process changes, we've now become exploitable. If we tell the tool, no, I never want to see that again, suppress it, hide it, don't show me again, then we're not going to discover when that actually becomes a problem. Ultimately, the vulnerability is still valid. This actually comes up more with SCA. <laughs> you know, with SCA, the question, oh, yeah, you've got library vulnerabilities, but are you actually exploitable to this library vulnerability? Now, there are a few reasons why you might never be vulnerable to a library exploit. But 
the fact is that if you're not using that vulnerable function today, that doesn't mean that the developer's not going to start using that vulnerable function tomorrow. Again, you can't say, well, I've got this old version of this library, so, and I'm not uh, exploitable to it today, so I'm just going to ignore it. I'm never going to look at that library again because you know, that particular vulnerability doesn't apply to me today. Because what about tomorrow? What about next week? What about next month? How do I know that I'm not going to be using that vulnerable library or that vulnerable function within that library in the future? Again, arguably, this vulnerability is, is still valid. It's still a potential vulnerability. I don't know if this would count as unexploitable or just hard to exploit. But I've seen cases where a DAS tool couldn't exploit a particular vulnerability because there was a, some sort of, sort of complicated prerequisite, there was something you needed to do, or there was a particular combination of parameters that needed to be used. And DAS tool just didn't know that. DAS tool knows a certain set of payloads. But it doesn't know the exact business situation that's needed in order to make the exploit actually work. So maybe you do the DAS scan, and it comes up fine, but someone comes along with a bit of system knowledge or does a penetration test, and they actually manage to exploit the vulnerability. So according to the DAS, we're all good. Even if it got to that functionality, we're all good. But because it didn't know the exact combination needed to run the exploit to make the exploit work, then it considered, you know, don't, doesn't see a way of exploiting it. So in all three of these cases, we've got a situation where we might not be exploitable right now, or we might not be trivially exploitable right now, but there is still a potential vulnerability there. Now, the easy thing to do is just to fix it. <laughs> Arguably the easy thing to do. You know, we upgrade a library, we put sanitizer in front of the code, we fix that particular vulnerability, and then we don't worry about it again. If we can't do that, then there are other things we could do, but we're going to have to keep an eye on it on an ongoing basis. How are we going to discover on an ongoing basis that we've not suddenly become vulnerable? We've not suddenly changed the business assumption. And there are ways of doing this. and we'll, It's not ideal, but I'll, I'll mention a little bit, little bit later on. So when we talk about libraries, we talk about library vulnerabilities. And so calling back to what I mentioned earlier on about the idea that you know, even if you're not vulnerable to it today, you're vulnerable to it tomorrow. Like, we have this sort of tension between, OK, on the one hand, we could fix this by upgrading the library, or we could investigate and try and figure out if we're actually vulnerable or not. There's sort of the two primary ways of assessing SCA vulnerabilities. And what I argue, which may be a controversial opinion, let's say, but let's, let's push this out of the security realm altogether. Let's stop talking about this as a security problem. Let's talk about this, again, as a, a development problem. Let's try and keep the libraries up to date to begin with. If we have a proactive process for actually keeping libraries up to date within the development team, within the development organization, it's understood that we need to keep dependencies up to date, we need to keep libraries up to date, then suddenly updating libraries doesn't become this sort of event. This doesn't become this extreme thing that, oh, no, like for security reasons, we suddenly need to upgrade work instead of building cool new features. Again, this is a little bit challenging. I think there's definitely pushback about this. But you know, first of all, we're, we're operating proactively. We're taking a proactive approach. We're saying we're not just going to wait for something bad to happen. We're going to proactively keep on top of things. We're going to make it part of our overall development process that we add new functionality. We bump up the version numbers of the, of the libraries just to keep ourselves closer to the most recent version. And by the way, it doesn't mean that as soon as a new version comes out that you download it and apply it immediately. You don't, you know, you don't necessarily do that upgrade immediately, immediately. But the idea is that you've got a process for doing that. It's expected that it will happen within a sensible period of time. You don't just wait until, oh, well, this is now on fire, so we'll deal with it. Because um, that's what happens. You know, you should, and again, I've seen organizations where this happens. They start off on one point X of this library, and it does the job, and they just sort of leave it. And then in the meantime, that library has gone to two point X, and three point X, and four point X. And suddenly doing an upgrade is going to be a big deal. It's going to be big interface changes in the application. It's going to be uh, a significant testing burden. I mean, doing that all in one go at any point in time is going to be hard. Doing that all in one go when there's an active vulnerability and you're worried about getting exploited and your customers are shouting at you is going to be very, very difficult, very, very disruptive. And you know, that sort of unplanned work is possibly going to lead to other mistakes as well. So keeping that as a planned activity, keeping that as an ongoing activity, will also hopefully reduce the impact of these third-party vulnerabilities anyway. And you know, ultimately, Odds are that if a vulnerability is detected, it's in the most recent version. But if you're on one back from the most recent version, then doing that upgrade is hopefully not a big event, hopefully not a big deal. And if any of you, by the way, are maintaining on-premise products or working on on-premise products, you know, I worked with an organization that had to maintain the last three years of versions of their on-premises product. 
So imagine trying to upgrade the libraries in a three-year-old product to you know, the most recent version of that library, and then everyone after that as well. So you know, this, I think it becomes a case where, oh, you know, upgrading is hard, but it may overlook the associated effort of doing everything else that's actually needed to keep the product safe. So, can we remediate in a slightly cleverer way? Can we remediate in a more strategic way? We can go through findings one by one and fix lines of code one by one. But what if we did this across the code base? What if we say, okay, we know we've got some SQL injection in the application, let's fix all of it. So I worked with an organization, they had a massive backlog of log injection vulnerabilities. They, had, they were doing logging all over their application because they wanted to know what was going on. They were using a log function, and this log function was technically vulnerable to log injection. Someone could stick um, new, new lines into the input, and it would cause new lines in the logs and disrupt the way the logs looked, potentially falsify the logs. And they were getting shouted at by their SAS tool. They had like hundreds and hundreds of vulnerabilities on the SAS tool saying, you've got log injection. And then you know, one day they came up to me and they were kind of smirking. They were kind of smiling at me. I was like, oh, hello, like, what's going on? I'm like, oh, yeah, we, uh, we saw a big improvement in our vulnerability st status this week. I was like, oh, yeah. So they said, yeah, we took our log function. We put it into a separate class, a wrapper class. And now we use that wrapper class all over the application. And we're just using that log function in one place. So we've gone from 300 vulnerabilities down to one vulnerability because we're now only using that log function in one place. So you see, we tricked the tool. We've now made a massive input, and I think we've finished with security for this year. We've achieved all our goals. And they were very pleased with themselves, but I was very pleased as well. So that's great, that's fantastic. You've done exactly the right thing. What we've done is you've taken this risk that's all over your code base, and they've put it in one place. You've put it in this one particular location. Everywhere else is calling to this one location. And now you can make that location safe. Now you can add the sanitizer that you need to make that input safe in that one location. So you've taken the dangerous feature, you've centralized it into one place, you've wrapped it up, and you've made that safe. So again, you've gone, you've said, okay, I'm not just going to fix this line of log injection and that line of log injection, you're going across the entire code base and basically wiping out the entire class of vulnerability. Um, there are other options for this as well. I mean, you can do that for many different types of vulnerability, but there are some that are sort of more specific, such as you know, if you have got a lot of text queries being used in the application, try and roll in an ORM. Again, there's going to be upheaval, but potentially less upheaval than gradually going through your code base trying to fix SQL injection vulnerabilities. If you're seeing a lot of authorization bypass or issues with uh, authentication authorization, maybe you can pull that functionality from a, from a third party or from a specific component, and then you know that all of your authorization or authentication logic, logic is in one component. Um, secrets. Secrets are a big problem. They end up spread all over the application. If you've got one secrets management mechanism, and you can always use that mechanism for your secrets management, and again, you've centralized that into one location, and you're not worrying about those appearing all over your application. You've got one known sort of company-approved remediation for that. But then that brings up a slightly different problem. You know, in the log, in log injection case, that was easy because that was being flagged up by SAS. That's an issue. But if you've got vulnerabilities that you know are vulnerabilities, you know there's an issue here, but maybe it's not always being flagged up and you've had to create some sort of custom functionality to wrap it or a safer version of a particular function. Or maybe you had an old function that you wrote internally that you know is dangerous, and now you want to use a new function. But how do you know if someone's used the old function? Some developer a few weeks down the line has decided, oh, right, this is how I'm going to do this. I'm going to use this old function because I'm not aware of the new safe function. So I'm going to use the old vulnerable one. How do you find that? And that sort of calls back to our accidentally exploitable. You know, what if we've had, um, we want to check that a particular SAS finding hasn't recurred, that we've not sort of lost a particular business logic check that was protecting us against vulnerability? What if we wanted to carry on using this vulnerable library and we know that we shouldn't be using this vulnerable function in it, but how do we find out that someone started using that vulnerable function? What if we've got an edge case in our DAST, in our uh, runtime, we've got an edge case that the DAST tool can't find, but we know it exists and we want to make sure it doesn't come back? And that comes down to customized testing, and that's a different topic, because that's a lot trickier, because you need to start thinking, well, what are the custom tests I need to write for this? What are the, the custom checks that I can build to do this? Now, on the one hand, it requires a little bit more advanced thinking. On the other hand, it can save you a lot of time and a lot of headache. Because again, now you can think about how do I make sure that I'm not just fixed, how do I make sure I'm not just protected against this today, but protected against this in the future instead. 
Um, so maybe the scanners can do that. Maybe you need to bring a, a different tool that will do that scanning for you. Um, but if you're interested in that idea, interested in the customized testing idea, uh, there's a talk later on from my colleague Michal. She'll be talking in this room um, this afternoon about customized testing sort of at the SAST and DAS stage, at the static and dynamic stage. So if that's something interesting, then uh, yeah, feel free to come down to Michal's talk later on about that. But that is for later. Um, for now, that, those are the tips from the methodology perspective. Um, so that's a summary of the different tips I talked about. I guess the, the key takeaways here, you want to understand how the tool is matching your needs. How is the tool going to solve the problems that you actually have? Is it suitable for your particular situation? Is it suitable for your particular challenges? You want to make sure you understand how to customize it to your processes, how to best use the tool's configuration, the way the tool works, the information the tool is providing you to give you value in your processes, to make sure you can understand, well, you know, how can I demonstrate what's going on? How can I demonstrate the improvement? You want to have a planned approach. You want to have a methodolog methodological approach to uh, dealing with findings, to addre addressing these findings. And possibly the biggest one, which I know was a tip by itself, but I think it's worth repeating, you know, everyone needs to be involved in this process. This is not just a security process. This is a development process. This is something that has to be part of building the applications. It has to be seen that way by management, and it has to be top-down by in order to actually make this happen and to give developers agency and give the other sort of players in this uh, particular process the time and availability to handle this process effectively. So if you want to get in contact with me, my details are here. Um, got a summary of the key takeaways. Uh, looks like we've got a few minutes for questions, if anyone's got questions. But uh, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate it. I mean, that's the sort of thing that, you know, we talk about things that are other people's responsibility and things that are specific to security. That's probably one of the more security tasks. But, I mean, I'd, I'd much rather that a security person was going through and making those decisions than running a thousand tests and letting the developer decide what's important. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's, 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 there's going to be some upfront effort, but it's one of those things that if you want to have that ability to sort of, um, what's the word, to sort of spread your impact, to have sort of magnified impact, to have a wider impact, and have others also, you know, force multiplier. Having the ability for others to support in the work and to support reviewing findings, there's going to have to be some upfront input to, to make sure that what they're looking at is going to make sense, is going to work for them, and isn't going to be overwhelming. Any other questions? Hey, go on. Good question. So, honestly, I've seen less IAST. I've seen less organizations using IAST. Um, I think that IAST is an interesting capability. For those who are not familiar, IAST um, basically instruments the code to provide some sort of link, some sort of blend between DAST and SAST, because you can have the code running at runtime, you can have runtime testing happening, but because the code is instrumented, you can actually see where in the code base that um, that dynamic testing is hitting, where, you know, what, what path that input is going through. So it gives you a slightly better idea because often the problem with SAS is you don't know what happens at runtime, and the problem with DAS is you don't, you're not sure where something's actually, actually happening at the code level. So I asked it sort of bridges that nicely, but I think probably because of the instrument, instrumentation needs, it needs to be supported by the, the code base, it needs to be compiled into the code base, I see that less. I think it's a, it can be a useful capability, but it seems to have a lot more effort in getting sort of a, a usable environment set up. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. To, there's, there's, there's extra work there, and you know, Rasp is the same sort of concept. But Rasp is usually looking for real attackers rather than um, sort of the testing stage. I think. From my perspective, what, you know, whatever works the tool. I think you know, most of the binary analysis tools seem to be able to pull them back to some level of code and seem to be able to provide the code level information. Otherwise, it'd be very difficult, and difficult to use. Um, I, uh, I, don't, I don't have strong opinions about it. I think, you know, obviously it's important to understand that different requirements, different needs, and therefore potentially different process. 
Um, I've not seen significant differences in terms of, oh, I like this one a lot more than I like that one. How do you mean, sorry? I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Either code scanning or binary scanning. Again, I think it, you know, it depends on the tool. It seems like some tools want code, some tools want binaries. Um, and it very much depends on the tool. Like, Again, I don't, I don't necessarily have a preference. Ultimately, the types of tests being done are generally the same. Um, and honestly, you know, they've, they've both got you know, potentially, you know, for source code scanning, you might end up scanning something that doesn't get compiled actually into the application. But honestly, when you're scanning binaries, you might end up scanning something that did get compiled into the application, but isn't actually your code. You know, I've seen that go both ways. So I'm, I don't have strong opinions one against the other. It's more a question of what does a tool want and being aware of what's going to be needed to get the scan. Any more questions? OK, um, I put some stickers on the side if there are any left. I think there are a few left if you're interested. Um, yeah, if you're interested in OWASP, feel free to come after lunch for the lightning talk. But yeah, thanks very much. Appreciate your time today.